Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Lens of history. <laughs> history lens here on Think Tech. John David Ann, history professor at Hawaii Pacific University, following on the track of our discussions in the over uh, the last few weeks uh, on, in the 19th century uh, involving um, the Civil War, what right. led up to it, right. and now we're in it, aren't we? Right. And we're right. going to see what kind of man Lincoln was. Right. Uh, you know, I don't think people, you know, they see him through the distant lens of history. Yeah. They don't yeah. see him up close. But yeah. we can see him up close. We can we can investigate this man pretty closely, and we can learn amazing things about him. Absolutely. Truly Absolutely. amazing man. I mean, what's interesting is uh, Lincoln's presidency is marked by this war. I mean, he takes power, and the war starts. He dies, uh, you know, a couple days before the war ends. Yeah. So uh, it's the war and, and his presidency are really synonymous Unlike, uh, and, and Lincoln was a hands-on commander-in-chief. So president as war maker, Lincoln was the guy. Unlike uh, really any other president after that. Uh, the Spanish-American War, I mean, uh, McKinley was not hands-on, neither was Roosevelt. The, the commanders in the field ran that war, and the generals at home. And then the wars after that, of course, the president became more and more distant from actual, the war-making capacity of the commander-in-chief, the president could say, drop that bomb, or the president could say, send those troops in, but the president never said, let's do an offensive here, and let's do simultaneous offensives so that we catch the Confederates off guard, or so we, we uh, reap the advantage of having more troops Why? than them. Why did he do that? Why did he feel it was necessary for him to get so closely involved? Well, I think part of it is actually a response to his lack of knowledge about war making. Uh, so Lincoln takes the presidency, and the Civil War starts with the, you know, the bombing of Sumter, Fort Sumter, and then Lincoln calls for these volunteers, 75,000 volunteers on a three-month uh, enlistment, uh, and he, get, he, he gets, gets them. He gets all of them, and he could take as many as he wanted, actually. He could have gotten way more than 75,000. Why, why, why was the community so up in arms? That's the wrong term, isn't it? Why was it so <laughs> up in arms? Well, they were so up Everyone in arms. responded to the, yeah, to the volunteer yeah. call. Well, they, there was tremendous passion about uh, secession. Northerners believed that secession w could lead to the destruction of the Union period. They feared for their political system, and in turn, they feared for their their livelihoods, and they feared for their lives. I mean, if the Union falls apart, then what's going to happen? So I think the, the, the act of secession really put the, a tremendous fear into the Northern public. But it didn't stay that way through the whole war. And I remember, in, not personally, but I do remember in 1863, there was a draft. You're sure it's not personal. <laughs> it's not personal. <laughs> you it's not personal for you either. No, no, you were not there. <laughs> Neither was I. There Let's was a draft that. in the spring of 18, or the right. summer of 1863. Right. There That's were right. riots. That's right. And all That's that. Right. So yes. that, that, vi that vitality, that uh, enthusiasm yes. changed. It yeah. did change, and it changed quite quickly. But if we could bring up a picture of Lincoln, it's worth looking at uh, the old man himself. Uh, Lincoln, of course, there he is, and this is Lincoln in the midst of the Civil War. And you can see, if you see earlier pictures of him, uh, his face has gotten so craggy and lined by this point from the stresses of running the war. Uh, but you can see the determination in his eyes and in his visage. This is not a man to trifle with, not a man to be denied. So he actually, th that determination made Lincoln a very good war leader. So, uh, you know, some people have compared me to Lincoln. I don't know. It's just a hair. Well, I'm, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure it, it works. But anyway, no I, experience I have in the war. actually, that's, that's no right. That's right. Country so, lawyer, politician. It's a long way from war. Yes, but he became commander in chief and therefore he had to take on this responsibility. He felt, uh, you know, obliged by the Constitution. and. And so what Lincoln does is Lincoln educates himself about warfare. Lincoln spends a lot of hours in the library of the War Department. Really? Yeah. Yeah, he actually has a cot over in the War Department where he sleeps some nights because he's waiting for telegraph uh, communications from his commanders out in the field. But so Lincoln studies warfare, he, and he, he develops a grasp of what we would call Napoleonic type of warfare techniques, essentially. Uh, the turning movement, which is if you can get your army 
on the flank of another army, then you can turn that army, and in the process, you have a very good chance of winning that battle. And then the, the issue of uh, simultaneous, si simultaneous advances, which is, uh, or what is called concentration in time, when you move all of your forces, all of the armies out in the field, you move them at the same time, therefore the Confederacy cannot move troops back and forth between the different theaters of the war. So you're essentially pinning them down. Lincoln understood both of those concepts better than some of his commanders. Oh, wow. Yeah. What a guy. But it also yeah. tells yeah. you, it tells you that he had whatever the, it takes to identify the problem, learn the specialties, yes. and then exercise the expertise, yes. uh, which yes. is truly remarkable. And I would, yeah. I would assume, and see if you can confirm this, yeah. I would assume this, it, it, he didn't only do this with respect to battlefield strategies. He did this with other things, too. Absolutely. No, Lincoln was very adept at, uh, at managing the politics of the time. Of course, there's great support in the early stages of the war. And then, of course, so Lincoln calls for the volunteers. Uh, he appoints a commander called McDowell. McDowell's in charge of the Army of Potomac in the first three months of the war. Uh, the Confederates gather at a point called Bull Run, which is near Manassas. Virginia, not very, about 25 miles south of Washington, D.C., and Lincoln says to McDowell, you need to send your troops out to confront these boys, and McDowell says, sir, we're green, and Lincoln says, I don't care, we'll all be green together, because <laughs> he understands that the Confederates are, the, the Confederates, yeah, the Confederates are green as well, so, so, so McDowell takes his troops out. It's assumed that the war, that this will be one battle and then the, the, the Johnny Rebs will be badly defeated. They'll run back with their tail between their legs and the Confederates will sue for peace. That was how they thought it would go. The battle itself actually uh, turns, and, and one other thing is that the, the public in Washington, D.C. also thinks that this is going to be a, a wipeout, you know, a, a, a great, oh, great yeah. victory for the and Union. the ladies in their finery and their carriages So if we can there. bring up, I have a picture of this. Oh, actually. is that right? Yeah. That is a picture from the Battle of First Ball Run. It's a picnic. <laughs> it's sometimes referred to as the picnic battle because the <laughs> elites of Washington, D.C. rode their carriages out to the battle site. They sat on a hill to the side and they thought they would see a grand victory by the Union. Well, for a couple of hours, the Union got the better of the Confederacy. And then the Confederacy did just what I was talking about. Uh, they concentrated in space. They took troops from the western part of Virginia. They brought them in by railroad. And by about 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning, then they were unloading these troops right into battle. Uh, and so the, this addition of other troops turned the tide of the battle. Uh, the Confederacy routed the Union by about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And Union, the greenness actually showed because the Union soldiers fled. They didn't regroup. They just fled pell-mell back to Washington, D.C., which left the picnickers in some trouble oh, yeah. because there they were at the battle site and you have, you know, ferocious <laughs> armed uh, Confederate soldiers. But right. the Confederacy also s stood pat. The, the, the roads to Washington, D.C. from Manassas were clogged for the rest of the evening as, as picnickers tried to <laughs> get back to the, the nation's capital. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> 25 miles, you can see it now. Yeah, right. So is this, this is after Fort Sumter? This is, yes, this is July uh, 1861. So this is the first kind of stub nose that the Union gets from this new war. And it turns out that it's not going to be a three-month war. Yeah. It's not going to be a battle of one war. And so now Lincoln has to think through, okay, what am I going to do next? How am I going to respond to this? And so there's a, another call for volunteers, and there's a much bigger call, and, and it's going to be a three-year term instead of a three-month term. Uh, Lincoln appoints a new general, General uh, McClellan, is appointed in, uh, in, in July 1861. And, and so uh, the Army of Potomac really takes shape. It's a massive army, uh, up to, up to 200,000 men uh, uh, camped in Washington, D.C. Uh, and so that's how the war is going to go forward. 
But the union also had to develop a strategy. Now that it looks like, okay, this, this could be a more serious affair, then the union had to develop a strategy for the war. Uh, and, uh, and the general in charge of, of kind of the War Department uh, was uh, General Winfield Scott, hero of the, uh, of the Mexican War. And Scott developed something called uh, the Anaconda Plan. So we, we've actually got this in our background here, but if you can bring up the, this oh, is, is, so it was, so this is not a compliment. This is actually a cartoon making fun of General Winfield Scott's plan. It's called the Anaconda Plan. So you can see there's a, there's a snake, uh, but the Anaconda Plan was supposed to strangle the South by cutting the South into two running up the Mississippi River. This snake is going a little wild, actually. It's way too wide. It should be going up the Mississippi River. Uh, but so, so many people made fun of Scott's Anaconda Plan. Uh, and many people made fun of Scott himself. We can bring up a picture of General Winfield Scott then. Uh, there's, there's the general. And, uh, by this time, General Winfield Scott uh, was, he was 72, I believe, and he could no longer ride a horse, suffered from dropsy. Uh, he was not much of a commander by this time. Uh, and he fades pretty quickly, actually. Uh, so, so the Anaconda Plan is designed to economically strangle the, the South, the cut, Confederate. Cut the South, what? Yeah. First, Cut it off from the north, so kind of like a boycott. Uh, well, blockade. They blockade. blockade the ports, the seaports of the Confederacy, and yeah. then they then the idea is to uh, go cut down in half. go down the Mississippi River and cut the Confederacy in half. Yeah. Okay. And uh, that, so the economic effect of that would be to make them surrender. That was the idea. Was that a yeah. good plan? Um, in you know, it led to good things. Actually, uh, it was not a plan that worked very quickly. Let's say it like that. Overall, I think actually it was probably a pretty good strategy. But you needed time to let it. You let, had let it have you had to have time to uh, take control of the Mississippi River. Mm -hmm. And the, meanwhile, you know, there's all kinds of other things that are developing that are not good for the war. So, uh, so Lincoln confronts these uh, tremendous challenges in the first years of the war. Um, you know, he's he's the kind of commander in chief who is hands on. Uh, he is, he's, he's actually directing his troops at times. He's saying, uh, you know, uh, so there's two armies. There's the Army of the Potomac in the east. Uh, this is the army at the Battle of Bull Run in there. Uh, and McClellan uh, is commander of that army. Uh, and uh, McClellan has a plan, okay? So Battle of Bull Run doesn't go well. McClellan trains up this massive army of over 200,000 men. And his idea is that you, you ship these men down to Norfolk, uh, Virginia, and this is actually behind Richmond. Then you, you unload them. They march to the backside of Richmond. Catch from, them from behind. That's, that's the idea, to catch them from behind, to mm -hmm. essentially outflank them. You know, this is a massive, mm -hmm. what we would call a, a strategic turning movement. And the idea was to take Richmond, because that was the head of the serpent. That was McClellan's idea. Yeah. Uh, Lincoln didn't think this was the best strategy. It's so interesting that you've named three or four generals already. It, it, sounded like, <laughs> it sounds like The Apprentice, you know? You're firing this guy <laughs> no, and firing this that is, guy. <laughs> this is so true. So here's the list. It's McDowell, McClellan, Burnside, Hooker, and Meade. Don't forget Scott. And well, right, Scott is the <laughs> commander of the, all of the armies, right? So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so uh, <laughs> it's a very, it's a motley bunch. They're not necessarily good leaders at all. I guess he saw that. Uh, well, he saw that and he, he felt he needed to coordinate it. Yeah, well, Lincoln, Lincoln uh, believed in McClellan at first. McClellan had a very good reputation. He graduated first in his class from uh, West, West Point. Point. That's right. He was, he was known as a strategic genius. Uh, he he was loved by his troops. Uh, very good at training. Uh, but so so McClellan takes his troops down to the peninsula. To the you know this is the the Chesapeake essentially out the Chesapeake and then to this peninsula. It's called the Peninsula Campaign. Mm -hmm. And but he moves so slowly. It takes him months. And of course, by the time he's down there, then the Confederates have built up fortifications and he can hardly move at all. It's a, it's a, it's a great strategy, but so poorly implemented. 
Uh, and uh, Lincoln constantly was harping on McClellan. Don't hold your troops back. Attack the Confederate Army. Uh, and so uh, he was, he did not like McClellan. Mm. The other thing about McClellan is McClellan was very arrogant. Uh, so one time <clears throat> early in the, in the war when, I think this is when Lincoln was going to appoint McClellan. Lincoln and his driver in the carriage, they go out to McClellan's home outside of Washington, D.C., and, and they knock on the door, and McClellan's servant lets them in and said, sir, I will tell General McClellan that you are in, and, and this is the president of the United States. And they sit there, and they sit there, oh, no. and they sit there until evening, and McClellan never meets with them. Finally, Lincoln gets back in the carriage, and he goes home. <laughs> oh, that's really <laughs> offensive. <laughs> it's, yeah. McClellan arrogant. was a very arrogant guy. So, yeah. so Let, let's yeah. take a moment and reflect yeah. on that during right. during the break. During the break, I'd like everybody to reflect on just how arrogant <laughs> it was to make the president wait so long he had to go home. We'll be right back with John David N. about history in the Civil War. Living in this crazy world Nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way. There's got to be solutions. How to make a brighter day. What do we do? We've got to give a little love, have a little hope. Make this world a little better. Try a little more, more than every morning. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, and I'm here every other week on Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. In Hawaii Together, we talk with some of the most fascinating people in the islands about working together, working together for a better economy, government, and society. So I invite you into our conversation every other Monday at 2 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Join us for Hawaii Together. I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. History Lens here on ThinkTech. We're talking with John David Ann about the 19th century and American history and history in, in the Civil War, and right. especially about the, uh, the, the development of the war and Lincoln, the yeah. development of Lincoln yeah. in the war, right. defined him, right. he defined it. Yeah. So yeah. What, can we take a moment to just talk about Lincoln and his personality, his character? Yeah, sure. Make so, him be able to do so, these things. So, and in, in his relationship with McClellan is, a, is really a point. In fact, he did not like McClellan. He believed that McClellan was more than competent, but the arrogance bothered him and the fact that McClellan seemed to never want to attack the enemy. Uh, but Lincoln was very patient. Uh, he let McClellan go and let him fail and let him fail. Uh, so his patience is a part of his Lincoln's success. Uh, Lincoln becomes a good military strategist, but he also exercises what I would call strategic patience. Um, and this is in the midst of all the pressures that he's under. I mean, you've got a public which is, by 1862, becoming restless. Oh, we haven't made, we haven't won many battles. The war seems to be going badly for us. And the thing about that, just to add a thought, is that this war is not happening in Iraq, it's not happening in Europe, it's happening right here at home. Exactly. It's affecting people where they live across the street, uh, down the block, and, and their friends and neighbors and relatives. And so, you know, it's, it lives with you every day. Talk about losing patience. No, I, absolutely. I mean, there, there were tremendous pressures on Lincoln, but Lincoln handled the pressure very well. Now, his family didn't handle it as well. His wife, Mary, was uh, depressed, and uh, uh, she had a terrible time handling being in the White House. They lost a child, of course, and, and she went deeper into depression. But Lincoln somehow was able to rise above it all. Lincoln develops this idea that the war has a transcendent purpose. And I think this is part of Lincoln's success, is understanding the war within the, within the great kind of historical train of the birth and the development of the nation, understanding that the war's purpose was not just uh, victories, but it was the restoration of the Union, and then it became freedom. Uh, freedom from slavery, the, the elimination of slavery. And so Lincoln has, he, he, for a guy who is not terribly religious, he didn't really go to church much at all. Um, 
uh, he had this kind of transcendent idea of, of reality, which I think really helped him. Maybe that's another part of his uh, kind of his makeup, his, his personality. This, was it um, a dynamic or was it always thus? No, it was uh, from the time uh, that he began to write and make speeches, he had this transcendent idea of the Union. It wasn't always slavery. That, that comes later on. And it wasn't just political either. He really believed it. He really meant it. No, he, he meant it. It was far above politics. He believed that the Union had a sacred purpose. That uh, is something. That is, yeah. that is a cornerstone piece of the development yeah. of the country. No, right that's there. right. That's right. And, and uh, uh, this, it, he used to call it the, this experiment in freedom. And, and, you know, it was an experiment in democracy. You know, the, the European nations were all monarchies. Uh, and they were, you know, it was kind of a singular experiment at that point in time. So, so Lincoln had this, he had this uh, transcendence about him. Uh, the other thing about Lincoln is he is very adept politically. So back to McClellan. McClellan is busy on the Peninsula campaign, not fighting, trying to avoid battle. And Lincoln is very unhappy with him because Lincoln keeps saying to him, don't worry about Richmond, go fight the Confederate Army. Because Lincoln believed that if you defeated the army, uh, Richmond didn't really matter. You had, you had to win this war on the battlefield, yeah. not by capturing a capital. Because yeah. you can move a capital anywhere. Uh, so, uh, so Lincoln gets fed up. And there's a committee in the Senate called Committee on the Conduct of the War. Uh, and Lincoln finally says, look, uh, McClellan, uh, I've got, I'm getting all, this, all of these complaints from this committee. Why don't you go meet with them and, and you can settle it? Lincoln forces McClellan to go before the Committee on the Conduct of the War where they eviscerate him. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're just tearing him to bits verbally. Uh, Lincoln understood it. He knew that he didn't have to put pressure on McClellan so much as if he put McClellan in a situation where others were putting pressure on McClellan, then boom. Brilliant. He, he, yeah, he could, he could meet his goals. He's a master so, politician. So he was, he was a, he was a yeah. master of political uh, you know, strategy and, and the, the art of politics yeah. as well. So uh, give him much credit for that. So uh, McClellan's Peninsula campaign fails. Uh, Lincoln is very unhappy with him, but he doesn't see a way in which he can uh, fire him at this point. Lincoln needs a victory. And McClellan finally gives Lincoln a victory in the Battle of Antietam in September 1862. Isn't that in Maryland? It is in Maryland, right near Sharpsburg. That, 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 that'd be north of Sharpsburg, Washington. Maryland. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is the first uh, Confederate foray into Union territory, because okay. Maryland, Maryland was a slave state, but still a part of the Union. Okay. And it is a, it's west and a little bit north of, of uh, Washington, D.C. It's close, quite close, actually, to Harper's Ferry, Virginia. Uh, 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 the Confederates uh, under Lee actually uh, conquered uh, Harper's Ferry in order to get to, uh, to uh, Sharps, Sharpsville and uh, Sharpsburg, pardon me, and, and the Battle of Antietam. The idea of Lee was he was going into uh, Union territory to demonstrate to the foreign powers that it could be done, right? That the Union, that the Confederacy was not just a fiction, but the Confederacy had a very successful army in an army that could penetrate into northern so territory. for fundraising? <laughs> no, not for fundraising, for recognition. He wanted the European powers to recognize the Confederacy as an independent state. Ah. If that happened, it's quite possible that England might have gotten involved and forced a negotiation between the North and the South. England had uh, more than a little interest in seeing the Confederacy becoming independent, would split the nation into two, weaken the nation immeasur immeasurably. Uh, so uh, so uh, this, this was one goal. And the other goal was to get his troops into the rich farmland of Virginia and so they could, they could essentially live off the land for a few weeks. So he goes into Virginia, he goes into Maryland. The problem is that Maryland has macadamized roads. They have roads that are made of gravel. Uh, so it doesn't turn into mud in the spring. That's right. And in the fall, in any time, this gravel is very sharp, and most uh, Confederate troops do not have boots. Oh. They march barefoot. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, so they couldn't actually march on the macadamized roads or the gravel roads. So he has a smaller, he leaves a lot of his troops behind. 
uh, but it's a, the battle is really a, it's like a tie. Okay? Neither side really wins, but the, the Confederacy has to retreat. Uh, Lee understands that his troops have to get back to, into Confederate territory, otherwise he might lose his army. And so he was he was out there away from from the Confederate geography. He was out there away from his out, out there away from his supply lines. Yeah. Most of his troops were back in Virginia, so he yeah. really needed to get back into Virginia. And so he couldn't prolong the battle. McClellan had far more troops than Lee. McClellan, if he had used all of his troops, he left thirty five thousand troops sitting on the sidelines in this battle, mind you. Uh, if he had committed all of his troops, he might have been able to capture Lee's army, and the war would have ended in but September 1862. Clown was not aggressive, not— He was—that's he, right. He was not an aggressive commander. But nonetheless, Lincoln could now proclaim victory. And this was important because Lincoln had another card up his sleeve. Lincoln wanted to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. So what's the Emancipation this Proclamation? This is 1862? This is, this is 18, yes, this is September 1862. Lincoln has been in the works, and honestly, it's the uh, Republicans in Congress, it's, it's his own generals who are pressing the issue of freedom for the slaves. Because in the areas that the Union Army had taken by 1862, the, the Union generals in charge of those areas had to decide, okay, do we free the slaves? What do we, how do we handle the slaves? Uh, and there was, you know, there was one general, General Hunter, who actually freed the slaves. Lincoln had to countermand that order. Uh, but Lincoln was himself, so he, Lincoln was being pressed towards freeing the slaves. So he was thinking about it. So after the victory at Antietam, then Lincoln issues what's called the Emancipation Proclamation to begin uh, January 1st, 1863. And the Emancipation Proclamation emancipates all of the slaves in the rebellious states. It does not emancipate the slaves in the Union, right? Because there were, there were four states, that, the slave states, that stayed in, in the, the Union. Union. Yeah. And those states, the slaves in those states are not emancipated. <laughs> Political mastermind. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not, so the, the proclamation itself is not transcendent. It's a, it's a war measure and a political measure. Is, it's, is it legal? Because, you know, later you need an right. amendment to the Constitution. No, that's right. It's, and now he's just doing this that's, by that's proclamation. Why that, I, that's why Lincoln had very uh, deep concerns about whether or not it was legal for the president to do this. So that's why he issued it as a war measure, a proclamation, and not as a law that was passed by Congress right. and signed by him. Do you think Congress would have passed it had he presented it to him uh, in 1862? I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think so, honestly. There would have been great uh, resistance among Democrats in the slaveholding states. Yeah. So where are we? Because uh, we, we have to come back and do more right, of this. Right, right. So, uh, so give, us, give us a sort of timeline yeah, so, of where we are. Right, right. So this is, this is September 1862. And Lincoln has his victory. He issues the Emancipation Proclamation. And the, the proclamation, as we will see in, in the next episode, it leads to the transcendent uh, Gettysburg Address. Okay, it's, so we can't, we shouldn't treat the proclamation itself as kind of, okay, it's a war measure. And that was, that was kind of a terrible, cynical move on the part of Lincoln and his cabinet. Because what it does, it leads to a, a refocusing of the war on the issue of slavery and freedom. Yeah, yeah. And this is huge for the country. Uh, Lincoln, in so doing, transforms public opinion, which had been moving slowly towards anti-slavery, into uh, uh, abolitionist. And then he transforms the purpose of the war into not just a war to save the Union, but a war to free the slaves, a war in which sacrifice is about uh, freeing the slaves and atoning for the sin of slavery. Okay, now that's religious language. It's clearly religious language. But, but, but it but, appealed to everyone that, at the time. That's right. And we'll come back to that when we talk about uh, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. When we come in, back, when we come back yeah. next time, I, yeah. if you don't mind, I'd like to parse through the language of that address. Oh, I think we need to. As yeah. I recall, he, yeah. he wrote it on a train. No, that's uh, right. On the way to Gettysburg. That's right. And well, he the had, words came to him. Okay, that's not quite true, actually. He, he had an earlier draft that he was working on. But he did work on his draft during the train trip. Uh, and then he worked on it that night as well. And 
Uh, well, anyway, I don't want to give it all away, No, Jay. no, but give us the first few <laughs> words. <laughs> okay, four score and seven years ago. That's, Our fathers you know, brought forth us. Well, that, go, Jay, go. <laughs> on this continent, a new nation. Yes, conceived right. Conceived and dedicated you know, to the proposition of liberty or something along those something lines? Something like that, yes. Yeah. I mean, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll put it up and so yeah. that... We'll you know. parse it. We'll yes. parse it yeah. next time. Yeah. So you better come back next time. This yeah. will be really good. <laughs> we're going to see the circumstances that uh, he was op Lincoln was operating under and see him create this fantastic statement of the new nation. Yeah. It was more than just a speech. Yeah. It was a statement, a vision of the new nation, yeah. and it casts a shadow from then till now, for yes. sure. Yes, yes. Thank you, John. You're welcome, Always James. wonderful.